Hey there, and welcome to a new video, and this time I'm actually going to show you what I have been up to, besides being a father in these trying times, <laughs> um, with very ill wa uh, wife, and of course making the occasional video here. Well, this is Ultramod, and Ultramod is what, in my opinion, is definitely the best historical mod for Hearts of Iron 4 out there. I have tried quite a few of them, this includes Black Ice and August Storm, I have taken a look at World Ablaze, kudos to them, and Total War, but they're all not my jam, due to various reasons. But Ultramod is my home now, and um, I actually joined the team at the beginning of the year. So, let's show you what we have been up to. As you can see, the German tech tree looks quite a bit different, with uh, even the armored cars having, early on, quite a few derivates. Um, but, something that you might also not be used to, these derivates don't unlock on the same days, uh, dates as the main tanks. As you can see, the Panzer Eger 1 only unlocks in three years, currently 1936, so 1939 as it is with most of its derivates, and the Marder 1, Sch oh, actually, Schwimmpanzer 2. It all takes a bit longer here. So you have to keep an eye on when the interesting derivates become available, and early on you just won't have any. We have the Panzer 3 with the infamous Stuck 3, and it's early the Sword Gun variant, of course, that is basically the vehicle that invented this line of armored ve fighting vehicles. We have the Panzer IV, that early on only gets a top Panzer. We actually have the Panzer 38T, that can change, can be changed to a Marder III or Schwimm Panzer 38T, you can convert them. And we have a nice little trick here, as you can see, these are all models. You have already seen that with the American tree. These are all follow-up models. Now our trick is that when you have Panzer IV's research, and you research the Panzer IV DEF, represent these variants, you can actually convert the older tanks to the newly researched ones. So that's a kind of a special trick we have there. Same is true here with the Panzer 38T, you can now convert it to the 1940 upgraded variant. Quite a bit more armor. The Panzer IV can then, at the beginning it's an infantry support heavy medium with a short barreled uh, small howitzer, and then can be changed in its role. And as you can see here, we have <laughs> actually pointed that out pretty clearly in bright colors so you don't miss it because this is now switching over from the infantry support uh, battalion to the medium battalion while the Panzer 38, uh, 3 Ausführung N switches over to the infantry support role so people don't get confused yeah the Tiger is here um, something you might also have noticed is that for some models the reliability is absolutely brutally low and generally reliability in Ultra is much lower. Why that is the case, I will tell you soon. We have also given some options for going off-limits of the historical way, like actually build the mouse and the E100, the E75 was planned, the E50 was planned, so those are in, and it goes down to the Leopard 1. Uh, also, the Rule 251. And uh, we gave the option to switch to the Panther 2 and then the Panther 2.8.8. .8. So you can decide to go the historical line and switching to the Panther F in the end, or you can stick to what originally was planned but then not done, go for an upgraded Panther. Other nations have similar options. For the Soviet Union, for example, there is the T-34M that was the planned T-34 uh, upgrade with uh, a new suspension and generally far better than the early variant of 1940, that has to be scrapped when the Germans invaded, so it's quite a bit more costly than the early one or the actual somewhat upgraded variant that was then in history introduced. So as you can see it's quite more costly, it needs more fuel, but its reliability is higher, and it's generally a better tank than this one, but as the Soviet Union you want the maximum output with tanks. So yeah, you can choose between the two. Uh, 
Also another thing that will probably keep you from going for the T34M, if you research the T34M you can't go for the T3485. Another nation that has this is Japan. That might surprise some. <laughs> but yeah, we have actually made a proper temp tree for Japan. I can tell you that was quite a piece of work and uh, as I like to say, I think I might have summoned one or two Japanese only demons while reading through all these various tank names. Igor, Hogo, Chimi, Chiha and so on. But yeah. Uh, here we have the historical line with the Chiha, Chiha Kai, the Type 4 Kinu, and yeah, then the upgrades that become increasingly ahistorical because yes, there were single prototypes or something like that. Uh, and the ahistorical line is the Chini, Chiho, and Chi To, which were all prototypes and projected, but since the war in China broke out, uh, the Japanese decided to go for the more costly tanks, so these are earlier available and cheaper. And generally not that bad. Of course other mages also have tank trees as for example France uh, whose tank tree is an utter ridiculous mess just as it was historically the case and uh, we also have of course the home of the tank the United Kingdom that also has a somewhat confusing tank tree but I think it's somewhat easier to uh, get through this than <laughs> the French one. Um, Italy also has its own tree and so do some miners like Sweden and Hungary. Up to the next point we have also incorporated the probably well-known NRM2 mod that massively changes how Navy is built. We'll take a quick look here at the German high seas fleet with the Panzerschiff hull Deutschland class Panzerschiff. That looks a bit different, does it? So, yeah, as you can see, the menu has changed. Uh, one of the things that are in this mod is a massive amount of different uh, available gun turret setups, and generally it's a bit more intricate, so yeah, we'll have to spend some time with it if you want to. Because one option is, of course, you go Research the naval technologies you want to have on your ships, which are also quite a bit changed. And then uh, build the ship in the ship designer as you like it. Or well, the other option is, for those that don't really want to bother with this part of the game, go down here, research the technologies that are requested from you, and you can just get the historical ships directly in the historical setup into your build. For well, the US that is quite extensive, so expect a few hundred destroyers, cruisers and carriers. <laughs> now, the NRM mod does not only change how the ships are built, but also something about naval combat, and we made some adjustments to it. So you have stuff like that uh, weather heavily influences carrier activities, so you won't really be able to get most out of your carriers in the North Atlantic. Um, we also made carrier strikes far more often to happen. Um, so good AA is important for your ships, and uh, but they do less damage per strike, but you have them far more often. So carriers reign supreme in the Pacific, but battleships can be really important because they th can throw a ton of AA in the air, especially when you go for dual purpose guns on them as secondary battery, and upgrade your AA sufficiently. Um, also, the naval combat general, besides the carrier thing, has been rebalanced quite somewhat, so heavy cruisers are worth it in certain regards, especially for uh, something like raiding fleets or, uh, for example, when you have to counter a lot of enemy escorts. Uh, there they excel, because we have increased the hit rate of heavy guns, but of course, Heavy cruisers are still in peril when the enemy rolls up with his own capital ships. Capital ship building times have been adjusted. Uh, the battleships take quite a while to be completed. As uh, a certain history YouTuber likes to put it, naval strategy is build strategy and that is far more the thing in Ultramod. 
We have already spoken about naval production, so let's transit over to basically what was originally the core of Ultramod, and that is production, industry, and resources. Now, our big target here with the mod, or even before I joined, was that the historical production numbers in Hearts of Iron 4 are, put it mildly, bullshit. <laughs> so what the team has done is we have massively scaled up the numbers of military factories, dockyards and civilian factories, but at the same time massively decreased their output. That leads to far more historical numbers because we could adjust them more granularly. And well, we have based all these numbers on uh, the data um, supplied by two pretty famous historians, namely Kennedy and Harrison. And yeah, actually Harrison has even answered to some of our emails and uh, provided us with additional details. So we have put a lot of work into that. Um, so expect, really, that you will suffer in terms of production with Germany from the get-go. Uh, to show that, we have also implemented uh, additional mechanics. In this case, it's once the Mayfor builds have been revamped a bit. And we have given additional resource production stuff and so on. Uh, that is historical to show how Germany tried to improve its uh, resource output and industrial output. Uh, it has other repercussions like that when you go through a tree that would grant you actual additional buildings and slots, you will have to do a decision that will cost you civilian, uh, uh, civilian factories to build. It's quicker than building them yourselves, but it nonetheless takes some time. Uh, so you have to plan accordingly. And auto key here revamps completely how, for example, Germany works with um, giving you a massive boost and changing your mixed economy to the auto key uh, economic policy. But uh, it has political repercussions. So generally, some countries work completely different. Uh, especially the capitalist countries are really good at building civilian industry and so on, while Germany better sticks to building military industry from the start. Now, we're already transitioning here from production to industry, so let's keep on going. What has changed about industry besides that we have increased the factory count but decreased their uh, production output? Well, we have already seen the mixed economy. Germany, for example, will struggle to get its economy rolling for war, uh, that is even more so true for um, the Allies countries, but nonetheless, let's show this. With Germany, you will be happy to go to full war economy before the war breaks out, and uh, reforming it and even go full mobilization will be really costly, especially since the total war uh, focus here requires you to um, actually suffer a ton of casualties above 1 million and to be at war with the Soviet Union and the United States of America. So that makes it really difficult to mobilize. Um, we have also given other nations like Great Britain and France and yeah, basically all the majors serious obstacles on the way to full war production. Uh, Italy is probably the one country that can go to full war production rather early. So same is true for Japan, but they both have, what is there, not that well known, a rather small economy and uh, with Italy, you will struggle to arm your army as you will with Japan. This, of course, leads to a certain problem. When you're playing historically accurate in terms of production and industry, the miners are screwed. The miners are important to support, especially the Axis, with uh, sufficient numbers of troops. But they won't be producing that much on their own. They just can't, because their historical industry count is abysmal. So if you need them, for their troops, not so much for their output, but sometimes, and that is another point <laughs> when we are in production and resources, um, for their resources, of course, because that has been changed too. Well, the first thing is only a name, basically. This has been changed, the tungsten to rare materials, so it includes a bit more stuff. Um, but what has been massively changed is we now have raw resources like coal, oxide and iron ore. 
As you can already see, Germany doesn't really need that much in terms of coal, but it needs iron ore. What do you need iron ore for? Well, one for that you need iron ore is the steel mill, because steel isn't just available. If you look at the map again here, the trade mode, you see that there is no steel really besides in certain locations. And that is not a resource that you can just gather like that. You need for that the steel mill, and the steel mill requires you to supply it with coal, one rare material, and iron. It's not just growing on trees, as some might say. The same is for, for uh, true for aluminium, which requires coal and bauxite. So keeping that balance is important, and every now and then you might probably run out of uh, one of the rare materials and then have to, uh, or iron ore, coal and you will have to reopen a closed down steel mill or aluminium smelter. Some might have already spotted it. We also split up synthetic refineries and rubber refineries. Um, yeah, rubber refineries are now rather costly because they cost you oil, as was historically the case. And as the synthetic refinery consumes quite a lot of coal, so if you overdo on this, you might actually run short on coal at some point. But, of course, you need them and they are useful, but they take a while to construct because they are rather complicated buildings. Okay, let's uh, show you another feature that ties into this, and that is a certain amount of map changes. Let's go for one of the prominent one here, that is Berlin, and as you can see it's a single tile province with a massive amount of factory slots. Just to show that, that is Berlin. It has more slots than the whole of Brandenburg. The same is true for Hamburg, for example. Um, the same is true for the Greater London area, but you have other areas in the world, especially in the US, that feature similarly. With, for example, Washington DC, uh, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Jersey is also single uh, single tile, and New York, and Long Island. So you have a lot of very small tiles, oh, also Boston up here, very small states, single tile, that have a ton of infrastructure and slots for factories. So make sure to make the most use of this, and these hubs are of course extremely important, so don't lose them and, uh, well, keep them from bombing. That is especially true for London and, for, of course, for Berlin and Hamburg. Uh, we have also implemented a few mechanics that will make it difficult to keep supplied with certain resources. A great example for that is the very important nation of Sweden that supplies the Axis with a lot of its iron ore and uh, rare materials. As some of you might know, the harbour of Narvik was very important for this, because it's the only ice-free harbour in winter. Uh, the Baltic Sea tends to froze, uh, freeze shut in winter in this northern region. So the harbour of Lulea couldn't be used to ship out the iron ore from the north of Sweden. That was why the Germans actually invaded Norway mostly, because they wanted to secure it as a route to ship their iron ore to Germany that Germany needed at the time. When you do this in Ultramort, when you invade Norway and you don't hold Narvik, then Sweden will embargo you. You won't get iron ore and you won't get rare materials for a while. That is to show how important this harbor was. And uh, that will certainly hurt you somewhat in your early war production. So yeah, allies, keep an eye open, try to hold Narvik. <laughs> and uh, yeah, in case you just want to ignore it, remember the Allies can take Norway too. Since no full overhaul mod is really truly overhaul when you don't overhaul the actual combat and the divisions, we have of course also done something to the division design and the combat system. So the first thing you will notice is that, uh, yeah, where are my battalions, where is my 20 and 40 width? Well, it's gone. 
the meter has been killed. <laughs> of course, there's always a meter, but uh, we have made sure here in Ultra that it's uh, a bit more difficult to find the sweet spot. And this is the standard front width in Ultra is 24 for province 96. So, yeah, as you can see, this division is currently only at non 21. So if we would upgrade that properly with, let's take a look. It needs more artillery, more AT. So we go with, as you can already see, light infantry, infantry we have here available, and even militia, but we want some more artillery. 23, and now we can put in some AA, and there we go. That is a 24 width division, and that's the endpoint. May you can't put in. There's nothing else you could do here. Of course, we have more support companies, and uh, that makes sense since we have more equipment, like for example the split between um, artillery. We have heavy anti-air, light anti-air, artillery, heavy artillery. So of course you need more support companies to get all this stuff in your division without uh, getting too much into these. So that is one thing. The front width uh, system has been changed. Also, you can see directly here how your division is being influenced by the terrain. The terrain itself, it doesn't do that much. The division has from the start uh, certain modifiers that show how they do in various terrain types. Uh, some divisions, or some battalion types, do really, really well in uh, urban combat. As you can see, infantry uh, is not really hampered in movement, and its defense is not that much decreased. In this case, not quite a bit through this. While infantry itself isn't really isn't isn't bad. As you can see, in urban combat, light infantry is actually pretty good, and maybe yeah, quite a bit better than the heavy infantry. So. Light infantry divisions in urban terrain are good, but light infantry on the other hand again is not that great in the, on the attack. But it's a way to get away from uh, pure infantry divisions, because they will hurt in open terrain. Uh, as you can see, these need different equipment. You see here, infantry equipment and infantry equipment, but also heavy infantry equipment. That was one of the new types of equipments we implemented. It's actually rather simple, but since these are generic and not nation unique, we're implementing some nation unique options here, especially for the US with the Garand. But besides that, that is pretty straightforward and easy to do. Uh, we have the same with the artillery. It's also not nation unique, but it changes a bit how you build your divisions. Combat changes are uh, very important for you guys probably to know. Tanks are really strong in Ultra and they will trash infantry in open terrain. Infantry is very good in dense terrain, it's very good in swamps like here or behind rivers. But please don't try to fight tanks, no matter how high, how high your AT rating and your piercing is, uh, don't try to fight tanks of any type in open terrain with infantry. It won't work. Fortifications help, but ultimately uh, the tank was developed to break fortifications and it can absolutely do that. Especially when the enemy fields something like assault guns or uh, a special type of assault guns with flamers that we also have in the game. Um, besides that, we also have it that certain tactics will result in decreased front width. So attacking all head-on and when the enemy then does, does something like an ambush tactic and during the combat the front width will go down and suddenly you will suffer massively. That ties into the doctrine it changes. Of course we have changed the doctrines too <laughs> because yeah well otherwise it would be boring wasn't it? Uh, wasn't it? So mass assault for the Soviets of course with the battle and mass mobilization, you will already notice that it's not a decision anymore. You can go for both, because historically they did both. Uh, so the mass assault doctrine of course gives bonuses to infantry and to generals using basically anything on the front line. Yeah, of course. And uh, line artillery gets extra soft attack and such stuff and later on it boosts the tanks and general organization and so on. Uh, helps with auto supply and decreases your front width for your infantry division, so they can be bigger. 
Then we have the asymmetric warfare doctrine that, for example, a lot of the miners use and Japan and Italy. That buffers infantry quite a lot, even light infantry, uh, special forces units, and uh, later on a bit on tanks. So that is a good tree for basically those nations that can't really afford big tank forces. Nonetheless, can, they can't be really strong because the infantry is very good on their defensive. And uh, if you get a few tank hunt, tank destroyers or something like that in them, they can be devastating. Then we have superior firepower for the Brits and the US, for example. Uh, here we actually have a decision, fast approach and the prepared approach. Uh, yeah, changes a bit how you use your divisions and uh, in the end it gets really, really strong when you use tanks on a lot of divisions as support companies, for example, and mechanize in depth with every force. And then we of course have the Bewegungskrieg Doctrine that is especially strong at the start and has one of the more specialized doctrines, the 8.8 cm flag batteries that shows the integrated use of 8.8cm uh, AA guns um, as anti-tank. So they get a massive boost to the anti-tank capability of the heavy AA, which is historically accurate. <laughs> you might notice that uh, we stick a lot to that. Yeah, Expect them to be fast, hard-hitting, but uh, they fall a bit behind against the superior firepower doctrine in the end. Of course, the focuses have been changed somewhat too. We haven't done too much to the Soviet Union, but you will notice that the Great Purge has been changed quite a bit. You should really take a look at every focus and uh, its effects. Uh, for example, the Great Purge should be done on its historical date, otherwise it might have some repercussions for you, or maybe you should do it earlier or later. It's your decision in the end, but you should definitely do it. Um, Non-historical events have been largely removed, uh, as an example would be Germany, where currently the ahistorical focus tree doesn't even exist. We will, after the full release with the reworked air, actually re-implement some ahistorical options, but uh, currently we don't think they fit to historical mod, and also most of the ahistorical trees that are in Hearts of Iron for Vanilla are really, really ahistorical and don't fit at all. Um, yeah, just thinking about the American Civil War and uh, the Japanese Communists. <laughs> but uh, some new focuses might be spotted, like Werwolf, Volkssturm, or uh, the Operation Wacht am Rhein. And yeah, reintegrating certain regions or uh, as another example for fighting the Soviet Union, prepare for blow. Now, I already mentioned the change air tech trees. So here you get a quick view at the German tech tree. We have done a few additional changes besides just splitting these up properly in proper techs. And we have also added the fighter bomber variant and the heavy fighter bomber variant, Tack bomber in German, that's why Jawohl. Uh, these are currently generic, so every nation has the same stats on the planes, but there are some, well you could say secret, they're not really secret, but they will pop up uh, certain variants that are a bit better than what other nations get. For the Brits that is some Spitfire variants, uh, for the Germans the Focke Wolf variants and BF-109 variants, and for the Japanese of course the zero. Uh, you might also have already spotted these. Those are the maritime bomber variants of these types uh, that are solely for targeting naval targets. And they're yeah, not bad at it, but their main advantage is a massive range over the regular torpedo bombers. And we have implemented the maritime patrol aircraft. These are very costly but have a very big range, and while they're not exactly the strongest in attacking, their main job is to supply air support and recon for active fleets. And if there's one thing they're actually good at, it's hitting submarines, as it was historically the case. The 
Last but not least, you have already seen uh, the changes we have done to some of the provinces with single tiles producing a ton. But that's not the only thing. We have only uh, we have also changed a bit how, for example, Norway is built up with uh, impassable areas or impassable province borders, resulting in some mountain passes that are rather difficult to take. So uh, Norway is quite a pain. So is of course Norway and Swedish border. That is especially true for Finland. That is now a tough nut to crack with these rather tiny areas where the Soviets have to funnel through while under the effect of the Great Purge. So Finland can defend itself better. Uh, Mannerheim has also been buffed and Finland actually has a, a specialized focus tree, courtesy of Fulman the Finn who provided us with it. Uh, another area where this is very clearly evident is here, the border between India and China where it is rather difficult for Japan to attack because they basically have only two avenues that are rather thin. So have fun there, that will be a challenge. <laughs> India can put up a fight in Ultra. Yeah. Uh, oh, almost forgot, we also changed the air zones quite a bit. As you can see, Germany now has a free, <laughs> quite a few more. Uh, that is especially true here on the Upper Rhine area. That includes the Maginot Line. So the Allies can actually fight properly in this area in the air. And that will provide quite a challenge for some people. Um, the same is true for Africa, North Africa more precisely. We have gotten rid of a gigantic air zone that is here in Vanilla and split it up in multiple air zones, which fits very nicely since airplanes in Ultra are reduced to the actual combat range, not flight range as in Vanilla, but combat range, that is about the half or less. And yeah, thus the shorter ranges make more air zones viable. And also rather important, at the beginning the Italians will definitely have an advantage here against uh, the Allies, since this air zone here is largely supplied from the Tobruk area, where the Italians have an airfield. But the British are again a bit better positioned here with El Alamein being outside that air zone, it's difficult to supply enough air support for an attack on this fortification. And when the British take Tobruk, then of course it's kind of difficult to push them back out again, since air support is now in their favor. So securing airfields is quite a bit more important than you might be used to, thanks to the new air zone system. Well, so much for this. Um, I might cover Ultra a bit more in the future. Um, I'm playing it every now and then over on my Twitch channel and I'm also participating in uh, multiplayer regularly every Monday evening at 9pm Central European Summertime uh, where we play the Ultra mod. Currently I'm playing Italy. So maybe tune in once and take a look at the mod. Uh, the link is in the description below to the mod and to the mod's Discord. And well, if you have any questions, post them in the comments and I will answer them. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed the video and yeah, see you next time.